program to hold the helm of academic ship in the campus in the person of Dr. Rodrigo de Abenes. Historic because as we celebrate the 159th birth anniversary of Dr. Serizal, it's the very first time that we meet virtually of this kind. First to witness how our speaker traces the critical pedagogy in Rizal's philosophy of education. And second, how we interact on the salient points arising from the speaker's discourses. As a social science professor for nearly three decades, I have handled the Rizal course for several times. We have scanned the pages of available books and used downloaded articles about his life, works, and writings. I even used some printed matters, both from Freemasonry and Catholic-inspired universities. But I have neither read something nor heard somebody getting the nexus between critical pedagogy and the results philosophy of education. A uh, possible connection of ideas between those of Rizal and Karl Marx or Friedrich, Friedrich Engels or between Rizal and Paulo Freire's uh, ideas. We are glad our speaker shall expound on this. What I am uh, personally sure of is that Rizal stressed on the primacy of education over infrastructure, saying when there is no light, there is no road. Rizal's activism and reflection got the attention of Ferdinand Blumentritt when the latter uttered, not only is Rizal the most uh, famous man of his own people, but the greatest man the Malayan race has produced. Rizal said, a life which is not consecrated to a great ideal is like a stone wasted in the field without becoming a part of any edifice. So we all commit uh, ourselves in uh, shaping up nationalists in uh, today's global world. So once again, thank you and uh, welcome to the Philippine Normal University, the Technology and Livelihood Education Hub here in the municipality of Lopez Queso. God thank bless. you so much, Dr. Avila, for setting the tone for this afternoon's webinar. The Rizaliana scholarship is still in an ongoing debate regarding the enigma of our national hero. The official doxa continuously resonates with the venerated and canonized American hero who invokes and legitimizes the false charity and hegemony of the neo-colonial powers and its ideological state apparatuses. Such views shared in the prevailing discourse that he is a reformist hero who repudiated the revolution that was initiated by Katipuneros. The Filipino critical pedagogue Renato Constantino identifies it as one of the causes of our miseducation. It is along with this debate that Dr. Abenes, our lecturer, who will be introduced later, will address. To formally introduce our lecturer on the topic, may I call in the floor Professor Brenda B. Villamore. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, my task is to introduce our lecturer for the 159th birth anniversary of Dr. Jose Rizal. May I share my screen? Okay, no, sir. Dr. Rodrigo Abenes is the current Dean for Academics and Technology and Livelihood Education of the Philippine Normal University, South Luzon. Prior to his appointment to PNU South Luzon, uh, may I, okay. uh, Dr. Rodrigo Abenes is the current Dean for Academics and Technology and Livelihood Education of the Philippine Normal University, South Luzon. Prior to his appointment to PNU South Luzon, which is known as the TLE Hub, he served as a full-time faculty of the College of Graduate Studies in Teacher Education Research of the Philippine Normal University main campus. He is also a lecturer of philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University. 
He serves as the PRO of Philippine National Philosophical Research Society and a longtime member of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines and the Philosophical Association of Visayas and Mindanao. Dr. Abenes earned his PhD in philosophy at the La Salle University in Manila. His research interests are philosophy of education, socio-political philosophy, culture and heritage, and Filipino philosophy. Lastly, he is also the man behind the localized philosophy and academic memes and parody songs in Aklata ni Tasho and PNPRS Facebook page. So let's all welcome our lecturer for today, no other than Dr. Rodrigo Abenes. Thank you very much. Okay, unmute, sir. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Brenda, for a very generous introduction. So uh, this research is part of my uh, actually research endeavor in the university. And this is also part of my sh uh, shifting of gears. Since I'm very much interested into uh, philosophy, but when I was assigned into PNU and teaching uh, philosophy of education, I was asked to realign my, my research agenda and it was for this reason that I shifted into uh, philosophy of education. So uh, my paper is entitled Traces of Critical Pedagogy in Rizal's uh, Philosophy of Education. And uh, the flow of my presentation will be as follows. First one is on a certain preliminary. <laughs> Is it? Richard, um, unmute lang, okay? So we have here okay, the preliminary and then the statement of the problem and then the Paulo Pereira's critical uh, pedagogy and also the discussions into uh, Rizal's philosophy of education and lastly would be the conclusion which is uh, what are the traces of critical pedagogy in Rizal's philosophy of education. So uh, last Friday, we celebrated Rizal's 150th ninth birth anniversary. And uh, to tell you honestly, even though Rizal is a very important thinker, um, very important thinker to me, but the problem is I was medyo nakalimutan ko ano uh, that uh, that is his celebration it's only the day uh, itself that i remember that it is uh, Rizal's birth anniversary it's because we are too busy uh, in the university uh, particularly with the transition to new normal and uh, if i've known that uh, that is uh, we we parang we can have a the commemorative or the celebrative uh, celebration on, on the day itself. But anyway, they better late than never, okay? So uh, in the preliminary, okay, uh, Renato Constantino, a well-known critical pedagogue, had said that either the revolution was wrong, yet we cannot disown him, or Rizal was wrong, yet we cannot disown him either, okay? So this passage reflects an inquiry of someone regarding our national hero, Dr. Protasio, Dr. Jose Protasio Rizal. Okay? And it shows that there is a clear dichotomy, clear statement that there is a reconcilable dichotomy between Rizal in the revolution that was initiated by Andres Bonifacio and the Katipuneros towards the construction of a Filipino independent nation. This dichotomy was deemed controversial and there was a numerous attempt by Rizaliana scholars in answering this contradiction and enigma. Accordingly, this dichotomy did not start from Rizal, but from his biographer named when, uh, Wenceslao Retana, who, interpret and mis who interpreted and mainstreamed Rizal as a reformist 
who only aspire for the Hispanization of the Philippine colony, who viewed Rizal as the Tagalog Quixote. Just like Quixote, Rizal was too much immersed into utopian imagination and he was not able to translate this into liberating and emancipatory action because he is just a hero of thought who lacks the realist and practical praxis of Bonifacio. This was later supported by Miguel de Unamuno, is a, a well-known Spanish existentialist philosopher who was Rizal's predecessor in Universidad Central de Madrid. He even added that Rizal is a Tagalog Hamlet, for he, like Hamlet, was a tragic hero. Rizal, accordingly, was a spirit of contradiction, who dreaded for freedom, but repudiated the revolution because he doubted his fellow of Obayans. This had been the official doxa, for it was reaffirmed and legitimized by well-known biographers, historians, and philosophers in the name of Guerrero, Joaquin, Agoncillo, Constantino, and Gripaldo, where they argued that Rizal's rejection of the bloody revolution was the result of his illustrado consciousness. According to Agoncillo, Rizal's rejection of the revolution was the result of his bourgeoisie interest. Because if it will occur, his class will be affected by this phenomenon. Renato Constantino, with his nationalist project of countering U.S. Inter imperialism in the Philippines, went further in concluding the need to overthrow Rizal as the preeminent national hero, for he conceived Rizal as the Americanized, canonized hero. It was no wonder that the Communist Party of the Philippines regarded Rizal as a traitor to Filipino people because Rizal called on the people to lay down their arms a few days before his execution. We are therefore guilty of venerating Rizal without understanding him. But despite of this conventional wisdom, there were still incredulity about this meta-narrative. They were supported by Tibuyen and also uh, Isan Juan, where they argued that Rizal's authentic revolutionary stance cannot be seen from his reputation of the revolution, but it can be seen through his collective orientation scientific creativity and civic construction during his exile in the Pitan. So that's why in my paper, I argue that Rizal's controversial stance on the revolution can be re reconciled by articulating and critically examining his philosophy of education, both in its theory and practice. Furthermore, it contends that Rizal's rejection of the bloody revolution is the result of his conscientization. So I divided my, my work into, into three, okay? So the first one is, okay, akin to this, Rizal was able to formulate his own, I argue that Rizal was able to formulate his own critical pedagogy ahead of its seminal arch architect, Paulo Freire. In, this, in doing this, I divided my work into three. So first one, okay, we will be discussing Paulo Freire's uh, critical peda pedagogy, second, Rizal's philosophy of education in practice. And the third one is a conclusion, and that is the traces of critical pedagogy in Rizal's philosophy of education. So first, okay, let us go into the discussions of Paulo Freire's critical pedagogy. Okay? Critical pedagogy refers to the philosophy of education that has developed okay, a critical theory of education. The term, or this term, was originally coined by Henry Giroux in his book entitled Theory and Resistance. Critical pedagogy or city etymologically comes from the two words, critical and pedagogy. The term critical, okay, was the term critical was the term that Giro borrowed from the critical theory of Frankfurt School within the theoretical legacies of the first wave critical theories, namely Adorno, Horkheimer, and Marcuse. Such term was used so as to highlight an attempt towards the development of modes of critique fashioned in a critical discourse that mediates the possibility of hope for social action. The term pedagogy, on the other hand, was used not only as a teaching method, but a social theory in order to highlight the dialectics of subjectivities, freedom, agency, 
and in the classroom and agency in the classroom everyday life. So, uh, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Press is considered as a classic text, not only in the critical tradition, critical pedagogy tradition, but also in the contemporary philosophy of education at large. Okay, this book was published in 1968 and has sold millions of copies worldwide. He is considered as an exemplary organic intellectual of our time. Okay? Uh, some would consider him as the Rousseau of the 20th century. Campol would consider uh, Freire as the John Dewey of the present era, and etc. And what made okay, Paulo Freire an innovative and unique educator is because his philosophy of education has its roots from his lived experiences as one of the subaltern subjects. As Freire himself testifies, and I quote, thought and study alone did not produce pedagogy of the oppressed. It is rooted in the concrete situation and describes the reaction of laborers, particularly the peasant or urban, of middle person whom I observed directly or indirectly during the course of educative work, unquote. His philosophy is a result of his deep critical reflections on his political repression during his public educational activities in Brazil. With this, he was considered as an exemplary organic intellectual of our time, for such term is appropriate to describe his revolutionary character and moral content of his contribution for his thought represents the response of a creative mind and sensitive conscience to the extraordinary misery, suffering of the oppressed in him. So that's why it is tempting to say that Freire is an easy to read writer right? because he was able to fuse his social theory and political ideas into a unique pedagogical conversion wherein its readers are active subjects. His mode of writing is in fact a dialogue and confrontation itself. With this, he was able to move beyond the binarism and created a critical appeal to the discourse because he was able to capture the imagination of politics of hope to its readers. And I would say that such was a gift to Freire of if one would read closely his pedag pedagogy of the oppressed, one would notice the affinities of Marxism, existentialism, and psychoanalysis in his text. And according to Dale and Margison, Freire was influenced by Marx in terms of technicalities and moral outrage and human agency and freedom for existentialism, that is John Paul Sartre in particular. Thus, we would say that one cannot really understand Freire in just one reading. One needs to reread and reread Pedagogy of the Oppressed and his works so as to unveil and to rediscover its emancipatory meaning by understanding Freire's metaphor. So, now, before we discuss okay, Freire's critical pedagogy as reflected in his pedagogy of the oppressed, it is imperative okay, and essential to discuss his Marxist assumption. As the title suggests, the entire book used these assumptions not only to show the technicalities and complexities of the technicalities and complexities of oppression, but also to express moral outrage okay, against dehumanization. It is therefore not just an intellectual exercise, but a complete renunciation of the oppression by a radicalization through education. Freire used Marx class analysis because it is important tool in understanding the plentitude forms of okay, dehumanization. So now, in order to understand this Marxist assumption, let us first revisit Marx's theory of base and ideology and his class analysis. Karl Marx illustrated in his preface in the Critique of Political Ideology in 1859 that society is composed of okay, two things, the infrastructure and the superstructure. The former refers to the economic base that has two general components. And this, the first is the means of production, okay, and the second is okay, the relation of production. The means of production refers to the, all the material and artificial instrument, including man's labor used for human productive activity. 
And the second is the relation of production and it, it's the social mechanism that determines the nature of production, namely what to produce, where to produce, and to whom to produce. The latter, that is the superstructure, refers to the ideological component of the state and such as okay, philosophy, literature, politics, and etc. Now, in explaining this, okay, according to Marx, in the beginning, okay, the relation of production and the means of production made by man in, is in harmony okay, with the prevailing stage of development. But time will come that it will have a conflict with the relation of production. Okay? The old structure will collapse through social revolution. Okay? In this regard, we could make certain distinctions, therefore, between reformation and revolution. When we speak of revolution or reformation, okay, using this framework, therefore, okay, refers to the slight changes in the society. This might involve changes in the superstructure, whereas revolution, on the other hand, refers to the entire changes in the society, and that is the total change of one society to another society, just like the primitive to slavery, slavery to feudal, feudal to capitalism, and capitalism into okay, communism. Now, with the first, okay, Freire, okay, Freire started with okay, his Marxist assumption that history is the history of class struggle. Okay, that is okay, the oppressor and the oppressed. Okay? This for him is an inescapable concern for it is not just an ontological possibility but a historical reality. Such reality is a clear manifestation of the humanization, okay, of the humanization and oppression. That's why in his pedagogy of the oppressed, okay, he discussed okay, these things. Okay, first one, pedagogy of the oppressed, okay, and then the nature of oppression, okay, and then after that we have education as liberation, and that is the task, okay, of the the oppressor so as not to humanize the oppressor as well. So now. Okay, according to Freire, okay, he, he contends that, okay, that there are two banking, uh, there are two kinds of okay, model of education. Okay? And that is the banking model and the problem posing. Wherein the banking model presents as an instrument of oppression, wherein there's a resistance for dialogue and treats students as subject of teaching. Whereas the problem posing, okay, is an instrument for liberation which promotes a okay, dialogue and students are considered as co-learners and therefore they are considered as critical thinkers. So now, in the banking model of education, okay, the banking model of education mirrors an oppressive society as a whole and it oppresses people by teaching them not only to conform okay, and it maintains the status, of the, status quo of the op oppression for it does not teach students to think. For it inhibits creative power by teaching necrophily. The necrophily for Paulo Freire is considered as the love okay, for death. Okay? And here, okay, he used or he made certain examples on why okay, there is oppression in the everyday classroom, everyday life. Okay? So, sabi ni Freire, okay, wherein, these are examples, wherein the teacher Okay, teachers and the students are taught. The teacher knows everything and the students know nothing. The teacher thinks and the students are taught about. And the teacher talks and the students listen meekly. And the teacher discipline and the students are disciplined. And the teacher chooses and reinforces his choice and the students comply. And the teacher acts and the students have the illusion of acting through the action of the teacher. And the teacher chooses the program content and the students adapt to it. And the teacher confuses the authority of knowledge with his or her own professional authority, which he and he sets an op opposition to the freedom of the students. And lastly, the student is a subject of the learning process while the pupils are mere objects. Now, it seems that many would argue that this seems to be not true anymore today. But if we're going to take a look at the form of leadership that we have, particularly in the bureaucracy of our department, we could make a certain analogy, okay? For example, okay, we can change, for example, teachers and students, okay? So, for example, we have here, okay, what is, okay, okay, this one, we change teacher, for example, to deaf ed and students to teachers, okay? For example, the deaf ed teaches and the student, the teachers are taught, 
Okay, second, we have the deaf ed knows everything and the teachers know nothing. The deaf ed thinks and the teachers are taught about. And the deaf ed talks and the teacher isn't meekly. And so on and so forth. Okay, so here we could see that there is a certain parallelism in the classroom everyday life and particularly in terms of a form of educational leadership. So now, okay, in problem posing, okay, people develop their power to perceive critically okay, the way they exist in the world in which they find themselves as they come to see the world not as a static reality, but as a reality in their process. Okay? So it promotes a dialogue and through dialogue, it responds to the essence of consciousness and intentionality wherein the teacher of the students and the students of the teacher cease to exist and a new term emerges in the student teacher with the student's teacher. So now let us now go into a uh, let us now go into the uh, discussions of the second. Okay, we're in results. Okay, where I'm going to discuss results philosophy of education. So we have a okay, the official doxa that Rizal advocated education in favor of the revolution. Okay? Although it has been mainstream that Rizal advocated okay, education in favor of the revolution, there are only three existing studies that have been done about Rizal and education. The first was the work of Oshas entitled Rizal and Education in 1921. In this work, Oshas had tried to represent okay, the first systematic representation of the views of Rizal in education by highlighting some of his views that had been mentioned in his two novels and the other important works, wherein Oshas concluded that Rizal advocated popular education, where he repeatedly bent into the idea of public education in his desire okay, for the enlightenment of the masses. With this, Rizal considered education as the prerequisite for liberation of the people. Okay, the second study was done okay, almost okay, a century, that is almost 90 years, okay, nine decades, you try to imagine that, okay? uh, particularly done by Kibuyen. And surprisingly, okay, it was written 90 years ago, okay, 90, after 90 years rather, after the publication of the work of Oshas. In the work of Kibuyen, entitled Results Legacy for the 21st Century, Progressive Education, Social Entrepreneurship, and Community Development in Dipitan, he highlighted the importance of Rizal's praxis during his exile in Dipitan. Here he claimed that many scholarship had downplayed the four most important years of Rizal, which he served as the model for his emancipatory praxis. Rizal's collective efforts of transforming Dipitan as a model colony should not be neglected, but it should be served as a clear inspiration towards the formation of a progressive society through education, commerce, sustainable community development. And the third was done by our colleagues here in Philippine Normal, particularly in the main campus. Okay. In this study, they were able to relate Rizal's view of education in relationship with the pragmatist term, sociality. That Rizal's philosophy of education, according to Reyes et al., is primarily anchored to the idea of the importance of, of school in the society. That school should be an organ towards a transformation of individual, towards okay, the embodiment of society, and that is the embodiment of socially responsible, okay, socially responsible citizens. Now, according to Rizal, okay, this is in his Noli, okay, the school is the base of the society, and the school is the book wherein okay, is written the future of the people. And according to him, show us the school, and we will show you the kind of people there are. Okay? So this quotation, I, I use this quotation as my point of departure in articulating his philosophy of education both in its theory and practice. As an, as an entry point, I will first describe the defection of Rizal of the Philippine educational landscape. And second is I will go into the discussion of his portrayal of the social structure. So now, okay, in the chapter 19 of the Noli Mitangere, 
Okay, particularly entitled Adventuras de Mas Maestro de Escuela. Okay. So Rizal actually depicted okay, the educational landscape okay, by showing or defection of the sad state of the 19th century uh, Philippine education. Okay. So what are the characteristics? Okay. The first one is there are what we call flight of teachers and uh, flight of students. So now if we're going to look into okay, the, the plot of the chapter 19, okay, Ibarra is talking to the, okay, the maestro, the schoolmaster. And we're in, we discovered that the schoolmaster is just a substitute okay, teacher. It's because the original teacher decided to go into buy and selling of a tobacco, okay, which is a which, which, which somehow could give more okay, income okay, into the teacher. But now the question is okay, and since Ibarra decided to establish a school as a form of revenge against their enemy on the ones who killed okay, his father, so he talked to the, the maestro or the schoolmaster. And he was interested into, into knowing what is the situation of the schools. And accordingly, okay, accordingly, the main problem is the flight of the students. Okay, because there are only few students who are attending the classes. You try to imagine, okay, the maestro or the schoolmaster have 20 or 200 students. But okay, how many? What do you think? Or how many students are attending the class? Okay. And accordingly, okay, to the schoolmaster, it's only 25. Why? It's because, okay, according to the maestro, okay, the pupils are not interested to attend classes because there were no reinforcement, no stimulus, and no encouragement. Okay. Second, in Germany, the sons or the peasants, okay, studies for eight years in the town school. Okay. By the way, Rizal considered Germany is, as his scientific home. Okay? That's why he is called also Dr. Oliman. Okay? It's because, okay, uh, later on I'm going to explain further. Who in this country, as the, the, the maestro would say, would want to dedicate half of that life with the result of neg negligible? They write, read, and commit to memory pieces of, or parts or sometimes a whole book in Spanish without understanding a word order parts, and what benefit can the son of the peasants obtain from the school? So here, we could see that there is a problem. And the problem okay, of the school during that time is pedagogy. There is a problem with the curriculum and also with the methods of instruction. So now, let us now try to take a look at the salient features of the late 19th century Philippine education. So the curriculum is four R's with emphasis in religion. Okay. So here, okay, the, the, the master, the school master says, you already know that in the majority of schools, the books are Spanish, except in catechism or in Tagalog, which varies according to the religious orders to which the priest belongs. And these books are usually novenas and tridus. Another salient feature is the corporal punishment as the method of traditional methods of instruction. Okay, this type of pedagogy can be likened into the painting of Francisco Goya. Okay, here is a painting of Francisco Goya. Okay, and this, this is entitled The School Scene, which is also known as El Letra Con okay, Sangre, or in English, in translation, the letters enter with blood, which is considered as a normative methods of instruction during the time. This painting has an iconographical and some interesting points. The fact that it is in the room where the pupils are sharing, okay, books signifies that indeed it is in the classroom. The focal point is the pupil who is to receive the whipping of the horse, the teacher that the teacher is holding in his hand, and in his front, okay, in his front are two aching tearful companions trying to recompose themselves in their clothes after receiving the lesson of the day. In the background are the rest of the kids who are perhaps accustomed to this normativity. 
And what is surprising in this picture is that there is a dog, okay? There's a dog beside, this is a dog, okay? beside okay, the teacher, which seems to be more calm, showing peace of mind because he submitted himself to the teacher. Now, okay, accordingly, okay, the teacher did not resign from that kind of situation, but he attempted numerous reforms, okay? And this is the first reform. So the first reform is, and I quote, I attempted to teach Spanish to children because besides the government ordering it, I also considered it an advantage for everyone, which I used the simplest method that is teaching phrases, names without resorting to grand rules, expecting to teach them grammar later on, and after that they learn to understand the language at the end, and if the few more alert could understand me and were composing some phrases. But... Okay, what happened? He was called okay, by the cura, okay, by the curate or the parish priest, and was insulted and ridiculed by saying these words. Okay, and I quote, don't use borrowed clothing with me. Be content to speak in your own language and don't spoil Spanish and it is not for the likes of you. So another, okay, since he was insulted, but... He did not resolve and okay, he did not resign himself from that. So what he did is he tried to borrow books from Tasho. Okay? And he read and read books so as to be retooled, okay? And to so as to be developed. Okay? And here he said that I saw many things under the light of a different okay, from what I saw before. I saw errors where I, before I saw only truths and truths in many things, which seems errors to me. But if we're going to take a look at it, okay, what he did is, okay, what he did is, he introduced different kinds of reinforcement. Okay? Uh, what uh, the schoolmaster did is, tinanggal niya yung, yung whipping, okay, and as much as possible, okay, uh, accordingly, in, in, the, in the lecture of uh, Guillermo, okay, Ramon Guillermo, he is somewhat, in this case, uh, influenced by Pestalochi. Okay? Wherein, diba, Pestalochi is the one who introduced blackboards, okay, alphabets, alphabet songs, so as to make the class uh, enjoyable. Okay? So, and he encouraged more okay, students, and in, yung tinanggal niya yung corporate, or corporal punishment, he saw that many students are, are attending the classes okay? and encourage critical inquiry okay, in the class. But what happened is that okay, he was again reprimanded okay, by okay, the Kura. Okay? Hardly recovered, I returned to the school and found my students reduced to PIP and the best of them had re they deserted with the return of the old system. And those who were left behind, a few went to the school to escape from the burden of working at home. So that's why I here, according to him, I nourished within myself a new hope and I attempted to make another try so that the children might not waste their time and benefit, if possible, from the weepings so that at least the shame of punishment would bear fruit for them, and I thought. Okay? So in Reform 3, he started to translate books from Spanish to vernaculars. The Tagalog, okay? He used Tagalog and used Tagalog text in teaching such as Urban, Urban, Urbanity of Hortensio and Pelisa, manuals in agriculture. He translated short pieces like The History of the Philippines by Father Baranier and enrich, enriched them with new insight. So, and in teaching geography, he copied the maps from the province and reproduced it in the tiles of the floor. So, but another, what happened? The new Kura summoned him. And told him that the first, okay, that the first should be the first emphasis of education is religion. That before teaching these things, the, th the children should be proved by an examination that they knew from memory the teaching of the church. And in the meantime, then when I was working for the children, according to him, to become like parrots who could recite from memory so many things of which they understood not a single word. And majority of the pupils are not yet able to distinguish the question from answers. And what both these things mean? Thus we will die, and thus we will proceed, though still to be born, and in Europe they, will, they still speak of progress. So, 
Now, the late 19th century Philippines, okay, how did Rizal okay, uh, depicted it? So, accordingly, the classroom reality, this classroom reality is a reflection of the social structure of the late 19th century. The classroom everyday life mirrors the oppression of the colonial powers. The depiction of Rizal in the LPD, particularly, okay, uh, Rizal used different analogies or metaphors. And that is the, the portabo, the arrangement of the passengers, and also the, the captain. We're in, okay, in the first one. Okay, in chapter one, Rizal used okay, analogies of the paportabo. Okay, wherein the paportabo is divided into the upper deck and the, the lower deck. Okay, so in this, okay, the those who are in the upper class, okay, are the Spaniards, the Priors, and the Peninsulares, and those in the lower class are the Indios, the Chinese, okay, and the Chinese mestizos. This chapter reveals also the way, the luxury, how, the lux, the, how the upper class live in a luxurious life. It shows that unlike the lower class who were suffering, the upper class were described as sitting in a very comfortable chairs, protected by the awning from the sun okay, and smoking huge cigars. So Rizal in chapter two wanted to show the conditions of the lower class who constituted the more major portion of society we're in the position we're in who are in the position of servitude. Those who belong to this class were Indios and Chinese and okay, the students. So besides mentioning the upper class, okay, the different kinds of people belonging to this class, one can see that the Indios were docile, for they did not complain or oppose abuses and malpractices. And in their suffering, they just lowered their brows or eyebrows indulge itself in self-pity. Now, with the salient features, there are two attitudes towards changing the transformation of this feudal social structure, and that is reformation or assimilation and revolution. So, in, in the reformists had aimed for Hispanization. They sought to fight for okay, five things. First one, equality, between the Indians and the Spaniards. And second, the Philippines should be considered as a province of Spain. Third, representation in the Spanish Cortes. Fourth, Spanish should be the medium of destruction. Fifth, secularization of the priesthood. And with the realization that assimilation will not be materialized, some had fought towards revolution. And this had been traditionally known by the establishment of the Katipunan by the Supremo Andres Bonifacio. The Katipunan had aimed to overthrow Spanish feudal society in favor of a new society. So now, in our traditional view, okay, it has been perpetuated that Rizal had only aspired for assimilation. So this view had been challenged by Palma, Kibuyen, Isan Juan, and Schumacher as erroneous for Rizal should be considered in two, two phases of national, nationalist political development. So the young Rizal, which is a reformist, and the matured Rizal, which is the... Uh, the, the revolutionary. And here we can see okay, this developmental phase of Rizal, particularly in his conversation with Ferdinand Blumentritt, the establishment of the Liga Filipina, and also okay, in his book, okay, the second novel, uh, El Polibus Trismo. So first, we now go into the LP, okay? particularly in chapter 7, the conversation of Basilio and Simon, where in Basilio, as the embodiment of assimilation, okay, where in Rizal showed Basilio as the embodiment of assimilation and Simon as the embodiment of bloody revolutionary struggle. The personification of the maturity of Rizal's nationalist ideals has been reflected in the different chapters of okay, uh, the LP. Basilio is the embodiment of the propaganda movement who advocated assimilation, whereas Simon is the embodiment of the revolutionary struggle. And according to Simon, okay, according to Simon, the Christ for Hispanism is an act of betrayal for, to the fatherland, for asking for it is begging for suicide, destruction of nationality, annihilation of the fatherland, and consecration of tyranny. Okay, no nakita sila ni Basilio, 
Clemente, the uh, Basilio was confronted by by Simon and by saying, "What will you be in the future? A people without character, a nation without liberty. Everything you have will be borrowed, even your very defects." You wish to add more language to the forty odd that are spoken in, in the island so that you may understand one another less and less. So Rizal recalled this developmental phase by using the lips of Simon in saying that instead of aspiring, okay, aspiring for, okay, to be a province, okay, we should aspire to be a nation. And in chapter 33, okay, Simon re-echoed the need to reinvigorate the society through bloody revolution. Okay? This bloody revolution, accordingly, is a concentration of tears, oppression, okay? a repressed hatred, injustice, outrage. And I quote, it is the last resort of the weak that is force, okay? force against force, violence against violence. And this act, he added, is not an act of being bloody and barbaric, but an act of holiness, perfection, and artistry. And it will end a tyrannical rule and the misery of the many by setting up a new group of young people and vigorous leaders to work out the new destiny of society. And with this new generation, there will be a society. And thus, it is imperative that with feudal social structure to renew the entire race. Then I quote, all Indios, Mestizos, Chinese, and Spaniards, all who were found to be without courage and without energy will be killed. Okay? Therefore, this reflects that all ideals of revolution are anchored into the proposition that changes must be affected in the political, economical, religious, social, and intellectual spheres of the inferred okay, from the conversation. Now, with the concluding, okay, with the concluding portion of the El Filibusterismo, one would notice on how Rizal condemned bloody revolution. This had been manifested in the fragmented conversation of Padre Florentino and Simon. He affirmed that there is a need to invigorate the Philippine society for it that caused its death. But despite of this characterization, he did not agree with bloody revolution, for according to Rizal, the sword plays a mineral role in social transformation. Hate never produces anything but monsters and criminals. Violence against violence presupposes defoliation and deformation, and not purification and redemption. He said that it's prerequisite to learn civic virtues so as to have redemption, for redemption presupposes virtue, and virtue presupposes sacrifice, and sacrifice presupposes love. Towards redemption, according to Rizal, or better still, according to Padre Florentino, there is a need to suffer and work, and work for the just and the worthy must suffer in order that their ideas may be realized and discovered. There is a need to secure liberty by making themselves worthy of it. And this can be realized by exalting intelligence, dignity of the individual, by loving justice, rightness, greatness, even to the extent of sacrificing one's life for it. And it will not be realized okay, accordingly with or without Spain. And this is perhaps a favorite quotation. Ko. They would always be the same, perhaps worse. And I quote, okay, according to Padre Florentino, what is the use of independence if the slaves of today will be the tyrants of tomorrow? So now, for Rizal, just taking into consideration, okay, we could depart that Rizal, the goal of education for Rizal is to enlighten and redeem the Philippines. Through education, through the study of civic virtues, and among other aspects, the natives who had wallowed in ignorance, fanaticism, and moral depravity could be enlightened and redeemed. Rizal is thus envisioning a new man, Enlighten human beings with dignity and responsibility of people who would recognize who would recognize okay, their alienability of rights to life, liberty, and property, who would refuse to submit to oppression and despotism. Rizal believed that with the realization of this new man, there is a new social order. But rather, okay, uh, he wanted a new regenerated individuals who are not only individually independent, but rather who are also individually free. A nation can be free without being independent, or it can be independent without being free. And between the two, it was necessary to obtain various freedom first. So defend okay, this by enlightened populace, by obtaining independence, okay, by 
in the, uh, obtaining independence. So, another important thing okay, that we can consider is how did Rizal okay, practice or what are the practices of Rizal? So here, in his exile in the Pitan, there is particularly a concretization of the utopian imagination in the adventures of the schoolmaster. Okay? For Rizal was able to transform, transform the said community into a model colony through the application of his educational ideas, through his collective, collectivist orientation, scientific creativity, because in the Pitan, he does not, he does not, he does not only serve as a medical doctor. He became a teacher, a community town planner, a community engineer. Okay? Why community engineer? It's because inayos niya yung, uh, yung water system. Okay? A community scientist wherein he discovered different kinds of species. Uh, when, while he was in the Pitan, okay, pinapadala niya yung mga species na discover niya. Okay? Pinapadala sa mga okay, uh, ethnologists okay, in, in Germany. And there are many species that is named after Rizal. If you go to uh, into the in, in Intramuros, particularly in Rizal Shrine, you will be able to see uh, the different kinds of species that Rizal was dis uh, Rizal discovered in in the Pitan. Okay, and also okay, Rizal okay, in 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 its establishment of school according to Kibuyen, uh, Rizal School in the Pitan has been considered as the first progressive school in in Asia. Okay, wherein there is the primary and secondary school. Okay. And then second, okay, another thing is that Rizal is also a cooperative initiator. Okay. Uh, he established different or he established cooperative, okay, wherein okay, he was able to uh, I would say to establish a a sustainable community. And you know, uh, when Rizal was in exile, he, he does not know anything, uh, anyone in, in, in the Pitan. But okay, after four years in the Pitan, okay, and when he decided to go to Cuba, and as if okay, the, the, the people of the Pitan are mourning, okay, as if they, are, they lost someone okay, who is their beloved. Okay? So, and this cannot be realized without the help of his students and, and the community. Now, what are therefore the traces of critical pedagogy in Rizal's philosophy of education? Okay. Rizal's controversial stance on revolution can be reconciled by articulating and critically examining his philosophy of education by in its theory and practice. And, and I would say that Rizal's rejection of the bloody revolution is the result of his consentization. I was not able to discuss okay, uh, the nature of the of oppressor and the oppressed, maybe in the conversation I'm going to expound it okay, uh, better. Okay? And, and here, I think I, I was able to argue that Rizal was able to formulate his own critical pedagogy ahead of his seminal architect, uh, Paulo Freire. So for the question, okay, later on I'm going to welcome because I know that I was not really able to articulate it okay? and we can discuss it further okay, in our conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Milano, are you still there? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Rod Abenes, for I know both social science teachers, professors are so engaged with your discussion, but as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, 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 I find it, I found it a bit like a roller coaster ride, okay. Uh, talking, talking about those pieces of information about about Rizal um, from the standpoint of, of the various standpoints that you have shared to us. Now we'll we'll open. Do we have a break or shall we continue with the open with the with the question and answer? I think maybe uh, my suggestion is. We can have a break, okay? Maybe a three minutes break, so that uh, someone can compose themselves, okay? And while you are still, or you are, we are having a break, okay? We can just show some okay, uh, cultural activities that we have here in uh, uh, PNUSN, okay? So then after that, we can have okay, the question and answer, okay?
Okay, so sige, we can have uh, the question and answer now. Okay, again, good afternoon. So we're receiving questions. We're practically in uh, the entire archipelago. So we have, so we would like to acknowledge our 51 or 50 participants. We have par participants from Cebu, Sambuanga, Davao City, Lanao. Of course, uh, much, ma most of our participants are from NCR. We have also participants attend this from B call. So our first question, Dr. Abenes, is uh, from Sir Alex Henon. So the first question is, uh, what is the idea of Rizal about the oppressed and the oppressor in the realm of education? I think this is the, the thing you mentioned that you are going to elaborate during the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we're going to thank you very much, Alex. You know, so uh, I think uh, I was not able to discuss a uh, results, uh, not results uh, idea of the oppressed and oppression, but rather I was not really able to articulate the idea of oppression, or oppress, oppressor and oppressed okay, in the ideas of Freire. It's because in results, okay, the idea of oppression can be looked into the distinctions between the upper class and the lower class. Okay. So in the El Filibusterismo, the, 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 the layers of oppression in the depictions of Rizal in the El Filibusterismo is very, very different in the depictions in the Noli Mitangere. It's because in the Noli Mitangere, we could say that okay, the social structure 
is divided into into different classes. Okay, we have the peninsulares, insulares, and then we have the Chinese mestizo, uh, the 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 Creole, okay, and then we have the 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 Indians. But in the El Filibusterismo, we could see a very different kind of defection, and we're in Rizal, okay, actually said that there are only two, okay, uh, class distinctions. It's between the upper deck and the lower deck. Okay? The upper deck are the oppressors, and the lower deck are the oppressed. And this has been shown, okay, particularly in the chapter one and chapter two of the El Filibusterismo. Now, it's also very important if we look into okay, the, the discussions of Paulo Prere into the nature of oppression. Okay? Why there is oppression? Okay. According to Prere, oppression is not an ontological reality, but it is an historical reality. Okay. So, as I have said, okay, he borrowed Marx's assumption okay, that there is oppression it's because there is the lackness okay, of the means of production. Now, if we're going to take a look at it, okay, there is particularly a dehumanization. And according to Prere, we are called, okay, we have an ontological vocation. And this ontological reputation can be either okay, you continue dehumanization or okay, you end okay, oppression, okay? dehumanization or humanization. Now, the distinctions between the upper, the, the oppressor and the oppression, the uh, oppressed is that okay, the, the, the problem with the oppressor is that the oppressor was, the, was able to develop a certain kind of psyche, diba? as I have said. Meron siyang in the psychoanalysis, okay? He borrowed deity from Eric Fromm, wherein the, the identity of the oppressor is that, okay? He considered others, okay? I, I know that you are very familiar with this, Alex, okay? Because you are familiar with Buber and, and, and Freire was influenced by Buber, okay? That, okay, uh, instead of an I and you relationship or an, an I and thou relationship, Okay. We, we treated others as an it. Okay. And that is, that is a kind of discussions of prayer. Okay. So we treated others as someone, as an object rather than a subject. Okay. So now the idea is, the idea of the oppressed is that the oppressor or the oppressed on the other hand wanted to be liberated, right? Of course, he wanted to be liberated. He wanted to get out of this oppression. And in getting out of this oppression, what happened? Okay. He wanted to be humans. But for them to be humans is to be an oppressor-like individual. Okay. So, yun yung nagiging problema. That's why for Freire, there is a need for education. And so that, okay, so as that the oppressed, okay, will not be an oppressor. It's because in the consciousness, okay, the unconsciousness of the, the, the oppressed is in order for him to be liberated, he needs to be an oppressor. Okay, I think I was able to, and in, in Rizal, okay, as you can see, why Rizal did not join the, join the revolution? It's because, okay, as he said, what is the use of independence if the slaves of today will be the tyrants of tomorrow? So that is a continuity of the, what we call dialectics. Okay, I think I was able to answer it clearly, Hello, uh, Alex. Our next question, Dr. Abenes. Um, how Rizal envisioned education in contrast to the Spanish colonial approach on education? Okay, uh, I think I was able to show it in the defections of the classroom everyday life. So here, we could see that, okay, what is the situation? Okay? What is the situation or what is the defection of the classroom during that time? And Rizal was able to show it in uh, the adventures of the schoolmaster. And Rizal is presenting an alternative. But it's very clear. I think uh, I was able to articulate it. And what are those alternatives? Okay, the first one is, okay, the first na ginawa niya is okay, he introduced a okay, Spanish as a medium of instruction. But when he, he was summoned by, by the, the curate, okay, then he later on realized na hindi pala pepede, okay, So he, he, 
he shifted into a a a, a pestilential a pestilential way okay and then but sooner or later okay tinanggal niya yung corporal uh, na punishment okay yung pamamalo tinanggal niya okay di ba natatanda ako naabutan ko yung pamamalo noon eh di ba pag pag ang teacher may hawak na stick tapos in cetera tapos ang kuko natin in chat so parang not, hindi ka nagiging creative natatakot ka okay so tinanggal ni tinanggal yon and then sooner or later pero since nagiingay ang klase na istorbo siguro ang kura sa kanyang siesta and then hindi ko na mention to na pagalitan siya ng kura at sabi ay ibalik ang pamamalo pero ang masakit doon is he was even asked by the parents na ibalik yung pamamalo it's because it is a tested tradition it's a tried and tested pedagogy so yun kaya binalik niya yung pamama, pamamalo napansin natin na umuunti na yung pumapasok sa klase and then after that another na ginawa niya is contextualization hindi ko to kasi nung na-articulate so kung contextualize niya he used vernaculars okay and then after that he translated books from spanish to 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 tagalog okay history books and also geography where in ito yung medyo nakakagulat ano okay uh, when you are teaching your students Okay, for example, a contextualized geography or particular, for example, a territory. You are somehow claiming that you have our own territory and that is already post-colonial thinking. That is a very advanced thinking. So, kung mapapansin natin, and ito ay hindi lang, hindi lang to inisip ni Rizal, hindi lang to suggestions niya. But rather, what Rizal did is, okay, he parang ginawa niya to in, in the pita. That's why uh, the Pitan has been transformed into a, a, a model colony. So, yun yung kanyang masasabi kong praxis. And even Kibuyen in Isan Juan would say that that is the most important. Okay? Yung, yung pag-identify pag ng mga species, ano, naming the, the world. Sabi ha, Paolo Prere has this naming the word, okay? reading the word in the world. Okay? So, you try to imagine na, yung na-name yung mga species. Tapos naka-discover siya ng mga already species. And then after that, that is already a big thing. Okay? Yung mga shells, okay? another, yung mga different, um, may mga na-invent din siya. Okay? Gumawa ng mga bricks and etc. through the help of his students. And they, they think that is already a revolutionary in a way. That is a very Paulo Prerian in a way. I think uh, for those who are interested in those questions, you can you can raise your hands as well so that you will be recognized. Ano para hindi na Dr. Milano yung mahirapan. You can use the icon in here in the chat box or in the participant ano, and then you can just raise your hand so as to be recognized. So we receive one, and I would we would like to hear your take on this opinion from Sir Dennis Tan. Um, he opined on this manner, ang aking sarili ko pong opinion, baka nabasa ni Dr. Rizal ang Art of War ni Zhu Chu, kung saan sinasabi na, do not fight a war, you cannot win. Tapos sinabi niya kay Dr. Valenzuela, kausapin ng mga ilustrado upang sumuporta dahil sabi din kasi ni Zhu Chu, ang digmaan ay may aspektong ekonomiya. Yun po ang aking opinion sa damdamin ni Dr. Rizal sa revolusyon noong panahong iyon. Maari po pa kayang ipalit ang mga mag-aaral, ang mga, ang mga aral ng Noli at El Fili sa Araling Panlipunan. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sir Dennis. Uh, with respect to, with regards to the idea of okay, that Rizal was influenced by Sun Chu, actually, hindi ko, hindi ko, I cannot make a, a claim on that. Okay? Because wala, wala talaga pa akong nakikita na 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 possibility of traces. But that is a good, actually an initiative work that you could do. Uh, in my work, you know, I, the initial thing that I'm doing before is a Paulo Prerian, uh, Paulo Prerian reading of uh, El Filibus Turismo. But sooner or later, I was able to articulate that okay, Rizal was able to develop his own critical pedagogy okay, ahead of Paulo Prere. And in my dissertation, okay, hindi ko lang to na-discuss, I was able to discuss the results, okay, 
reputation, sooner or later, ilalabas ko din to. Reputation of uh, revolution is the result of his socialist inclination. So, uh, nakapag-guha na rin ako ng mga textual proofs on that. Pero ilalabas ko yan sa mga susunod na siguro na buwan. Ano? So, siguro this is okay, namin ay mention okay, ni Gio Apostol. I apologize in advance for not being able to read the site for the follow view. I believe that there are commentators who suggest that uh, Simon's final interaction with Padre Florentino's exhibits okay, our authoritarian voice first considering anarchism but eventually abandons the idea alongside sentiments for violent revolution. Would you agree okay, with this view and so why do you think that Rizal would consider anarchism in spite of the growing popularity of the Marxism in the West? Okay? So ito yung kanina minemension ko na sabi ko hindi ko i-discuss. But anyway, okay, if we're going to take a look in Okay, in 18, when Rizal arrived in Europe in 1871, okay, there is a prevalency of socialism. Okay? And then when we speak of socialism, that is anarchism and okay, not just anarchism, anarchism and Marxism. So that is particularly the peak of what we call first international. Okay? So in anarchism, okay, in 1860s, okay, Marx and Engels, Marx, Engels, and even his counterpart, and that is the, the anarchism. Okay. So that's why socialism during that time is already, it's not just an idea. Socialism is already a practice. Okay. So now, uh, if we're going to look back, for example, into the life of Isabel de Reyes. Isabel de Reyes Okay. The first anarchist, right? Okay. Uh, the first Filipino anarchist. But, okay. But, okay. In my, in my opinion, okay. In my, in my take, okay. Rizal should be considered as the first, okay. Uh, socialist, not just in, not just anarchist. Okay. Why? It's because when we speak of socialism, that is, okay, a combination of anarchism and Marxism. Okay. So when we speak of anarchism, we are not only talking about anarchism of Bakunin. Okay. We are also talking about anarchism of Robert Owen. We are also talking about anarchism of uh, Prodhon. Okay. And in Asinero, Asinero had said that Rizal was most likely influenced by Prodhon. And I agree with Asinero. Okay. That Rizal was influenced by Prodhon. It's because, okay, uh, Murait, uh, P.E. Margal was influenced by by Prodhon, okay? And Rizal has a certain works, okay, in La Solidaridad about P.E. Margot. And if we're going to take a look, ito, medyo para makonvince natin. In the El Filibusterismo, the nitroglycerin, it was mentioned by Benedict Anderson, is a patented okay, anarchist invention. You try to imagine, okay? Diba? Yun yung ginagamit na bomba. Rizal used that okay, as a form of symbolism of revolution. So, kaya talagang meron siyang, meron siyang socialist inclination. Okay, but later on, yung iba ay hindi ko pa muna kasi napaka-unti na lang ng oras natin. Ano, and it will going to take us about an hour or two or, no, or even more to talk about his uh, Marxist inclination. Okay, sooner or later, maybe I will dedicate also a lecture on that. Okay, so what else? Can Dr. Rod, can you still entertain one, one question? Uh, yes, I can entertain questions naman. Okay, we can, actually, after one or two questions, we can formally end, okay, the, the hmm. I mean, the, the lecture, the webinar, but I'm still available for, for dialogue until 6 o'clock. So we have still, for those hmm. who still wanted to stay, I know, so we can still talk about it I know, for, for almost one hour. The question, uh, Doc Abenis, is from Sir Al Alfred Kasuga. We are from the we are far from the pedagogy of Rizal's time, and a lot of things changed already. Now, as we see that as curriculum, specifically the learning competences given by them, how can you say that we have fully grown? We have grown fully from Rizal's time up to now in terms of curriculum and ped pedagogy, and how do you think? the revolutionary mindset of Rizal can change our pedagogy of education right now. 
Okay, actually, that is a very good question. You know? uh, the reason behind I'm doing this kind of work, it's not because I'm interested in Rizal only, but rather I'm more interested into looking into uh, what we call our own Filipino philosophy of education. Okay? Majority of you are teachers here, and I'm teaching uh, in the grad school, okay, contemporary philosophy of education. And one of the reasons na kinalilingkot ko is that when I try to take a look at the syllabus, okay, what we are teaching into our students are particularly more into Western. So that's why I'm trying to look into a possibility. Do we really have our own philosophy of education? That is particularly in our own context. So that's why I'll try to take a look into our luminaries. So my first attempt is to look into the philosophy of education of Rizal. Okay, another, okay, I'm trying to take a look into the philosophy of education of Renato Constantino. Another is also I'm looking into the ideas of philosophy of education of Emerita Esquito. And another, ito buhay pa, you know, medyo radical to, na kaunti, you know, kaabe, to be you, uh, amable to be you. So meron akong ginagawa, I interviewed him, okay? And majority of his works in philosophy of education are scattered in his uh, textbooks. So, pero nakagawa na dun si Dr. Cortez. Ano? Pero gusto kong gawan yun ng confirmation. Ano? And who else? I still don't know. Ang hinahanap ko pa ngayon ay ki Pedro Orata. Since in PNU, we have the Orata building. So, and also, uh, Orata is also the one who introduced uh, high school to the barrios as a solution to the growing problems that we have. Okay? So, yun yung mga considerations sa mga hinahanap ko. Uh, that's, that's the reason why. Ano? And I think I was able to, if you are really more interested into that, I have a lecture on that in my YouTube channel. Ano? You can just okay, browse my uh, YouTube channel and Rodrigo Abenes and you can take a look at some of my lectures on about the in search of Filipino philosophy of education. Okay, so maybe another one, maybe, uh, siguro yung mga magtatanong ay pwedeng, you can just raise your hands or even, ano na lang, then para makita namin kayo. Ano? Kasi yun nga, we cannot really see the face of the other. <laughs> buti yung iba, nakikita ko, si Ma'am Labiling Cruz ay nakikita ko kasi buti, ano, kaklase ko siya dati no, during our result training. Uh, sino pa? Last two questions for formal discussions and then we can have an informal one until six. Somebody from uh, the room can ask question, directly ask question to Dr. Abenes. If none, there, I have seen one question here, Sir Rod. So that's... Kung ang lahat... Sige, sige. Kanina yung question galing? Uh, Kay uh, Sir Junel Season Musni. Okay, Sir Junel, pepeding you just ask a question directly to me so that you will be recognized. Ano? Hello, good afternoon, sir. Nasa, uh, Junel, can you have your video on? Uh, wait, sir. Para makita ka naman namin. Ano? Ito, sir. Okay, sige, Junel. Okay, so good afternoon, sir. Ang tanong ko lang sana, kasi I'm thinking um, ang naging solution kasi ni Azal is about the conscientization. So, kung ang lahat na naging bayani ng Pilipinas ay sinundan yung ganun, ganung klaseng pag-iisip na hindi tahas ang solusyon sa pagkakalaya ng Pilipinas. Siguro po ang, mag, ang naisip ko lang, ano kaya yung mangyayari sa Pilipinas kung lahat ng naging bayani natin ay sinundan yung ganung pag-iisip na hindi sila humantong sa dahas para makantam natin yung kasarinlan sa lahat ng mga dayuhan na pinilit sa kupin ng ating Pilipinas? So, uh, Junel, yun na yung tanong mo. Um, so, that is ano, a hypothetical question, right? Opo, 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 sir. Uh, maganda. That is particularly a version of what we call ontological hope. Okay? Tayo naman, ang kagandahan sa ating mga guru ay tayo ay laging merong hope. Hindi tayo nawawala ng pag-asa. And that is a good thing. It's because you're, it seems that you are saying na you have this hypothetical imagination. You have this utopian imagination on what will happen if we follow okay, these ideas of Rizal. Pero the problem is, 
we need to to take into consideration ito yung isang argument ko kung bakit ko sinulat kasi to the reason behind it's because Rizal was even used as an ideological apparatus by the Americans in order to colonize us because Rizal was even perpetuated as a reformist so anong ginawa sa atin ng mga Americans ang ginawa sa atin ng mga Americans they introduced reforms okay and these reforms ay yung mga binigay ng mga ito yung hinihingi natin dati sa mga Kastila okay for example okay uh, ituro ang Ingles bilang kasangkapan ng pagkakatuto. Okay? Second, ang Pilipinas is considered as the province of America. Okay? Another representation in American Congress, diba? batas tayo din sa copy. Okay? Another is, okay, for example, establishment of schools, equality between the Filipinos and, and the Americans. So, nandun eh. Pero, ang nung nangyari, okay, Rizal was proclaimed as the national hero of the Philippines. What is the reason? It's because Rizal should Okay, for them, should serve as the model citizen. Pero, problem, mali kasi yung, mali yung ginawang putrayal kay Rizal. Okay, kasi merong kinumission. This was discussed by Kibuyan Torrelli. Sino yung mga kinumission? Sinabi ko na, ano, we have, for example, uh, 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 sino ba, uh, yung kanil, un Unamuno, we have Wences Lauritana, we have John B. Foreman. So, kaya kung mapapansin natin, yun yung naging problema. At hanggang ngayon, patuloy at patuloy pa rin tayo minumulto ng ideological apparatus na to na si Rizal ay isang okay, asimilista okay, na pumapabor okay, para sa kolonyalismo. Dahil pabor siya sa asimilasyon. Kaya nga, ang gusto ng, ang gusto ng tingnan mo, ang gusto ng, ni Renato Constantino to overthrow Rizal. Ang gusto ng CPPNPA to overthrow Rizal as a prominent national hero. So, yun. Pero kung maganda, maganda, maganda masundan kung yun ang pinalo. Pero, kailangan nating in a critical pedagogy, kailangan nating tandaan na hindi lang sapat yun. Kailangan gumawa pa rin tayo ng panibagong development ng critical pedagogy ni Rizal. So, yun lang yung take ko. Ano? Pero masarap, masarap i-imagine. Yun, dahil yun ay ano natin ng ontological work. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so last, maybe last one question formally. Then after that, we can have, maybe request ko kayo for a formal picture taking <laughs> so that we have a remembrance for this webinar. So anyone? From, uh, I have seen one question from Ma'am Sherry Joy Del Mundo. Uh, yes, Ma'am Sherry, uh, are you still there? Yes po. Okay ma'am, para naman ma-recognize ka. Hello, good afternoon po. Good afternoon. Ma'am, pwedeng pa ano ng video on para makita ka naman namin? Uh, pwedeng hindi na lang sir. Sige po, sige po, I respect mo na. So I have written my question about um, the manner as to how we would be teaching the subject per se to the uh, millennials of today. Uh, because the concern would be Rizal being an old course, paano natin gagawin that Rizal be, uh, that the Rizal course be contemporary and fresh to the students of today? Actually, diba, I think uh, that has been a problem when we are in a training, you know, in teaching Rizal life and works. So, sa akin kasi yung, I have different positions into that. You know? uh, maybe, Okay, para kasi we are already tired of Rizal because yeah. okay, lagi nating nakikita na siya anywhere. Ano eh, lagi nating nakikita every town mayroong Rizal Street, mayroong Rizal Park, mayroong Rizal statue. Nakikita natin siya sa piso. Parang as if everything is already known about Rizal. So, yun yung nakikita ko. Kaya nga ang problema, parang as if we are already experts of Rizal. Pero the good thing about it is that there are many scholars who are really interested into digging that is something new into Rizal. Okay, for example, we have new scholars now. For example, trying to take a look into the liberal ideas of Rizal by Claudio. For example, the scholarism of, for example, uh, another is, for example, Ambed Ocampo. Another, we have okay, the late uh, Benedict Anderson. 
uh, for example, uh, another would be Carolyn Howe. Another would be, for example, Kibuyen and Isan Juan. Pero the good thing about them is that they were able to have a new study of Rizal and presenting not the old horse. It's because they are presenting Rizal according to their own discipline. Okay, for example, okay, uh, Kibuyen is presenting Rizal in a political, uh, political philosophy. Okay? or political science. Okay? For example, Carolyn Howe is presenting Rizal into a literary figure. So different instances. Okay? So, and I think that will be a very interesting one. Uh, for example, in my case, I'm presenting Rizal as a philosopher. So we're in, nakapag-present tayo ng, ng bago. Uh, yun yung nakikita ko. Ano, na, for example, if you are, kasi ang, the problem is, since Rizal is a mandated course, okay? by the Rizal law, ang nagiging problema, marami ang mga nagtuturo ng Rizal kasi na fillers. Aminin man natin na nagtuturo ng Rizal life and works kahit yung mga hindi naka-undergo ng training and et cetera, sila yung nagtuturo. Tapos ang patuyaran nila, anyway, Rizal lang naman to. Okay? So yun ang nagiging problema. Pero, kung ang gagawin, for example, ng mga nagtuturo, kahit from, they are from different or if you're going to do, for example, in such a way na it will be presented in a very different way. For example, uh, depende kung anong discipline mo, mas maganda yun kasi you will be presenting a new perspective on Rizal. For example, sa inyong case, ma'am, I, for example, the Rizal as, as a literary figure. So, yun yung nakikita ko na mas magandang may present. And, and of course, yung atake natin, would be very different. It's because, now, what will be the competency in presenting results? Sa iyo is the literary competency side. Sa akin, the philosophical competency side. Sa iba, would be, that, for example, if you are into education, so, yun naman yung ibang, ano, the concerns. So, tingin ko yun yung maganda uh, suggestion ko. Pero, I'm not into saying na ito lang yung tamang pagtuturo. No. Um, mas maganda, we can teach Rizal in a very diverse way and that is according to our own strength of discipline. So, yun. Okay, last okay, one. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you. Last one. Anyone from the group? Okay, sige. Sir Richard Nelias. Richard, are you still there? Richard, you're raising your hand. Oh, nawala si Richard. Anyone? Okay, siguro po kung walang question, muna sa formal. Richard, nandiyan ka? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, sige, Richard, you can have your, own, your question. <laughs> Uh, sir, can, uh, sir Rod, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, sir, I, I just have uh, some clarifications with regard to the philosophy of education of Rizal, especially of, uh, you know, saving uh, the country from domination. You know, it's very ironic, especially uh, I remember when uh, Rizal uh, reminded uh, his sisters, like Josefa and Trinidad, especially when they visited him in Hong Kong. Yeah. And uh, he reminded them to, you know, to learn English as, as a language of instruction. And I can remember that one. And, and for me, that is not, not a sign of liberation. And the second thing that I would like to point out is during uh, her, uh, I mean, his younger years, uh, he was actually... Uh, prodded by, by his mother to, to learn Spanish poetry. So what kind of education that we are actually, you know, trying to assert here as our, our Filipino identity? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that very nice question. And, uh, and for me, the point is it's very ironic or it's some kind of contradiction, which I cannot actually understand. Uh, sir, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, if we're going to take a look at in, uh, into it, you know, uh, uh, you are right in telling that Rizal is also encouraging, okay? Even his niece and nephews to study other languages. He a polygon. And he, yung pagtuturo ng English, he encouraged yan. Not just English. But even, okay, uh, his students, okay, 
uh, other languages, okay? particularly German. Okay? And Rizal sees nothing wrong in it. Okay? Uh, the reason behind is, okay, if hindi, hindi naman pinapriority. Okay? That is just a reinforcement. It's because okay, if we're going to take a look at it, okay, Rizal, in, in, if we're going to take a look into the Adventuras, okay, the Escuela del Maestro, he is already showing us a sign that the way to teach, okay, iba kasi yung mother tongue ng pagtuturo at iba naman yung magtuturo ka ng ibang lingwahe. Hindi naman sinasabi na ang ituturo mo ay itong language na ito, ito yung magiging medium of instruction eh. Can you see the point? There's nothing wrong into learning other languages. Okay? But, okay, there is something that is wrong, okay, na sinasabi niya, okay, maybe, yung ano na, if you're going to teach others by using, for example, uh, Spanish as a medium of instruction, there's something that is wrong on it. Okay? So, for example, ano ba yung pwede nating mabigay na mga other, other example? Okay. Uh, Rizal wrote four books. Or five pala. Five books. Okay? So, uh, ang medyo akala lang natin, dadalwa, no? So, dalawang nobela. Another ay yung kanyang tinranslate na William Tell na inregalo niya sa kanyang kapatid. Another ay yung pang-apat ay yung annotation niya kay De Morga. Okay? At pang-lima ay yung makamisa na nadiscover ni Ambeto Campo. We're in sinulat niya yon sa okay muna sa Espanyol then after that sinulat niya into uh, Tagalog. Ang problema hindi niya natapos. Kasi ang nagiging problema nga ay uh, the problem is uh, nahihirapan siya magsulat. Mas nahihirapan siya magsulat sa Filipino rather than okay pagtuturo pagsusulat sa wikang wikang Espanyol. So, pero kung mapapansin natin, when he was already, part of his research is also about linguistics. Okay? Indigenous languages. Meron siyang ginawa about, about mga Visayan languages. So, kasama to ng conversation. Kasama to. Kaya kung mapapansin natin, ang daming pepeding tingnan dun eh. So, yun yung take ko. Ano, yun yung pinaka-take ko dyan na consideration. Mas maganda ituro natin to sa vernacular o do sa language ng naiintindihan ng Sujante, it's because it will present into reading the word in the world. And that is a kind of perspective. Hindi, hindi siya ironic. Kailangan, nat, kailangan natin mag-aral ng wikang English. Kailangan natin, we need to master the language of the colonizers. We need to master, okay, the, these things. Pero kailangan magkaroon din tayo ng consciousness na ito ay, ito ay hindi sapat. Ano? Kailangan pa rin, kasi yun yung consideration natin. So that in, in the in the words of Sviba, we can speak. Diba? Kaya nga yung sabi niya, eh, can the subaltern speak? So if we know the language, we can speak against them. We can speak against uh, the post-colonials. Okay, so siguro ay uh, ang ganto na lang po. We can have our picture taking and then after that, we can continue our conversation and then those who are medyo may gagawin pa po ay Eh, pwede na po kayong umalis if you are busy and etc. And then for the certificate is that we're going to try our best to send it next week. So, yun po. Kaya nakalagay po yung ano. So, pe, pwede po ba nating i-video on natin? So, do, hindi naman po ito kwersahan, pero those who are, ano, you can have your video on so that we can have our picture taking. Okay, so meron lang pong app, uh, tatlong ano to, na paano natin. Sige, one. Pwede na po, one, two, three. Okay, another one. Another one. Okay, one, two, three. Okay po, so we are now formally ending okay, this uh, webinar. I think siguro before we end, we can have it muna yung departing words from our uh, EDP. Uh, Dr. Roel, you have any parting words? 
uh, maraming salamat. Maraming salamat muna kay uh, Dr. Milano uh, sa kanyang uh, pagtulong sa atin. Ano? Uh, sana makasama ka na namin sa <laughs> mahabang uh, panahon. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Rod Abenes. Uh, Sadya na uh, kami mapalad sapagkat uh, kasama ka namin. At uh, isa sa mga uh, bagay o ideya na nakapag- uh, palikot ng aking isipan na yung uh, paggamit ng Ingles, no? o kaya German, o kaya ibang lingwahe. Uh, meron akong uh, comment na isinulat dyan. Ito ay kagaya ng pag-give ng tubig mula sa ibang balon. Hindi ibig sabihin ay ayaw mong gamitin yung sarili mo kundi. Tama yung kuturan mo, Dr. Abenes, ay na ikaw ay, uh, gumag- tayo ay gumagamit ng lingwahe ng mananakop upang mas maintindihan nila ang kanilang sistema ng pananakop. Mas lalo tayong magiging uh, uh, Indio kung hindi natin sila naunawa. At sa ganyang uh, bagay ay gusto kitang batiin at ang lahat ng mga dumalo, uh, mabuhay tayong lahat at mabuhay si Dr. Rosaris. Okay po. Maraming salamat po, uh, Dr. Ruel. So, we can now formally end our, our discussion pero we can continue it for our formal discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. O yung may mga tanong pa po ay available pa po ako or po tayo mag- Chart, may follow-up question ka? Ano ko rin? What? Iba? Ayan. Ano ako please, no? Ay, man, ito bang... Ito na hinis. Okay, wala na po bang questions? Okay, siguro ay wala na. Ano, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Milano, and also sa mga lahat na maraming salamat. Takit suli tayo sa susunod na linggo. We're going to have a, another webinar about uh, pedagogy also. So, thank you, thank you very much.